Lookalike Podcast is sponsored by Sonic. All right, welcome to the Lookalike Podcast. I'm Alex Glaze. We got Rick Garney. He's executive producer, sure. senior producer. That what sounds are you? good. I like I like the way you described it. That's fine. Let's my go ahead my ahead. boss. You're you're my boss. But you're, you're here to join me this week. We got a lot to get to. Uh, obviously, Super Bowl week. So we're going to talk a little Super Bowl. Um, we have a, a guest who won't be playing in the Super Bowl this year, but a local guy who is playing in the NFL, working his tail off, uh, playing for the Green Bay Packers right now, Shannon Sullivan. We got to sit down with him coming up, and we're going to talk some Super Bowl prop bets. But uh, Rick, I want to start here because it, it's Super Bowl week, but it doesn't feel yeah. like Super Bowl week, right? I mean, the, the passing of Kobe Bryant um, really shook shook the world, and everything kind of stood still Sunday, and it felt still. Even Monday, it still feels kind of weird to, today. Yeah. Does it feel like Super Bowl week to you? No, not really. I was thinking about that, too. And, and you mentioned it shook the world. It, it shook the world, the sports world. I mean, yeah. the news world. It was, you know, every news channel broke in with coverage of what happened. And it's continued. And it's going to continue all week. We're seeing now that the Lakers are doing a, a media thing after practice. LeBron you know, and Anthony Davis. Not that's speaking. being broadcast right. live. The, the next Laker game's Friday. So that's going to be a big issue. So this is going to dominate the conversation all week, and it's totally understandable. Yeah, and there were a lot of conversations as everything was happening, because I believe I was here in the newsroom when, when everything happened, and it all kind of happened around 2.30. And, yeah. you know, those 3 o'clock games, there was a lot of discussion of should games have been played on Sunday. Um, they did play those games. Do you think that that was the right call? So when it first happened, and we were all sitting here together, and I said... And actually, all of us said, what are they doing? There's no way they can play these games. These players don't want to be out there. They're, this is uh, their friend, some yeah, former teammates, uh, someone they looked uh, up to, a role model, an yeah, icon. I mean, they I were mean, crying in the pregame, yeah. and it was just really weird. But then, as the games went on and the end of the day came, I kind of looked and I thought, it was kind of neat to see them all do their tributes to Kobe Bryant, whether it's wearing the jersey number or doing the, the hand signals for his number. I said maybe that was a really good way to honor him, to play the game, to let all these tributes kind of take place, the moment of silence, let the fans chant Kobe. And at the end of the day, we got to Monday, and it wasn't the end of the world as far as what the NBA did. I didn't see a lot of people really criticizing them for doing it. So, So maybe it was a good call because it allowed these players to kind of get it out of their system, but also honor him in their own way, and that's by playing basketball, which is what obviously he loved to do. Yeah, I didn't see any criticism of that either. either. Um, I don't have, I don't think there's a wrong answer. I think if they had canceled games, no one would have said anything. I think, I mean, they did play the games and that wasn't uh, the issue. I think the only, the only problem I probably have from the past couple of days is um, the people that are are bringing up, um, you know, the sexual assault case and there, were, there was even a, a reporter that put out that stuff. As this news is still coming in uh, around three o'clock, she's, you know, posting links to to that stuff. And not this isn't like any new stuff that mm-hmm. she's talking about. She's just posting a link that's over a decade old and and throwing it out there. I got a problem with that because it's not like this is a, a Hall of Fame enshrinement when you're like, hey, don't forget about mm-hmm. this stuff too. This is a man's dead. Yeah. Um, family. Friends, teammates are grieving. The world is grieving um, and still processing the information. And then on top of that, you know, you also have kids that, you know, he was on his way to his, his daughter's basketball tournament. Right. A lot of kids look up to him. A lot of kids that are on Twitter and on social media that can read. And to see that kind of stuff, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, I think that we're all humans. And I think people forget that sometimes and just throw stuff out there. I don't, I don't like that stuff. Here, here's what I would say. I, I think that any remembrance of him... Um, if you're going to talk about him, his career in full, in total, and you're writing maybe like an obituary piece well, when's or the right time? When's piece, the right time? No, no, and that's what I'm getting at. Then obviously you have to put that stuff in because that is part of his legacy. I think in the, in the moments and hours after his death, if you're tweeting that or you're talking about that, and that only, with no other context, just saying, hey, here's this link, remember this, what he did, that's obviously in poor taste. I don't think anyone would argue that. I think... It, it's okay. I saw a headline. I think it said it's okay to be conflicted when talking about him and remembering him and, and talking about his death because of what happened. And I think that's fair too. I don't think you necessarily have to share that in the hours and minutes right after it happened if that's all you're talking about. But like I said, if you're writing a whole piece about his career, 
Absolutely, it's That's fair part game. of his story. Absolutely, because it happened. But as far as you know, forgiveness and things like that, I mean, only you know the woman involved in that situation. It's up to her not whether she wants to forgive him or not. It's not up to us. If we want to talk about it, that's fine. But you're right in the sense that don't throw that part out there by itself right Here's after he died because there's no that. context and then you're obviously just looking for a reaction. The problem I also have with that is you're using someone else's darkest moments mm -hmm. in, you know, in a very dark moment for, for the Bryant family as well. So it's yeah. just, there's, there's no winning in that situation. I don't, I don't get it, but I mean, that, that, that stuff happened as well. But anyway, um, yeah, so all the Kobe stuff happened yeah. and it still feels weird to be talking football or to be yeah. for there to be a, you know, a Super Bowl because you know usually the week leading up funny. to the Super Bowl it's like you're that's all yeah and even can... even Saturday and Sunday because you know a lot of us here have gone to the last couple of Super Bowls because the Falcons were in one there was one that was on our station so we went to the one in Minnesota obviously the game was here last year so right. we've all been around the Super Bowl for a couple of, of weeks and we've been a part of that and I don't know if it was necessarily the teams who were involved maybe no Patriots you know there's really no bigger than life character in this Super Bowl either. I think that's part of it. And then, yeah, the Kobe Bryant stuff happened, and that's what people are focused on, and rightfully so. I mean, when is the last sports icon, I know he was retired, but who, who passed away in such a tragic circumstance? It's, so it's soon, been a long time. I mean, uh, I think our Jeff Hollinger said maybe Dale Earnhardt Jr. was the last one. He was still, I mean, Dale Earnhardt Sr., have, Dale Earnhardt Sr. That didn't have the same ripple Right, but he was racing at the time. He was still active, and it was completely different. It was before social media. So yeah. this is the first one like that where we've seen this kind of outpouring in 24-hour stuff. And that's, that's dominated the conversation. I mean, Roger Goodell was asked about it today in his Super Bowl press conference, and they're going to do something on Sunday for Kobe Bryant. So it's definitely the story of the, of the year, of the decade so far. I know it's a, a short decade, but it'll be probably the story of the decade going forward until, until the end of this 10 years, because what else, you know, what else in, in this magnitude and this level of shock can you experience? I mean, it was something that, um, you know, we'll remember. For sure. Absolutely. Uh, it's one of those moments where you will remember where you were when you heard the news and you don't mm -hmm. know that those moments are going to uh, something that's just going to stick with you for forever, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we got that stuff out of the way now. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's switch gears. We got a sit down with Shannon Sullivan coming up. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, Shannon's a guy played at his college ball at, at Georgia State. Um, he's from Georgia. And he's a guy that has been underrated his entire career. I met him a couple years ago uh, as he was getting ready for the NFL Combine. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he's a guy that went undrafted, ended up playing for the Eagles um, for a little bit, got hurt, um, got picked up by the, the Packers on a one-year deal, and has just grinded for every he's had and then this year started making plays picked off Dak Prescott we're gonna get yeah. into all that with with yeah. Shannon but I just kind of give you a little backstory of him he's, he's a really special guy and really starting to leave his mark and get the attention of the uh, of the NFL yeah you talk about we were talking about you know how what captures the uh, the attention of the sports world stories like that are why we all like covering this stuff a, a, the kid, underdog. a kid like that the underdog like you said undrafted and here he is. I mean, we need more stories like that. And, and this week, we need more stories like that. Do you think Aaron Rodgers is washed? I'm going to just put you on the spot before we go. Absolutely not. I think Aaron Rodgers, I think, is one of the most, ta maybe the most talented guy as far as just general talent, overall talent, natural talent, to ever play quarterback. So I think he's got a couple more years. I don't think he's washed at all. Um, I think he had a pretty decent year. Listen, he had a new head coach. I'm not actually convinced he has a lot of weapons out there. And so, no, I think, he's, I think he can do this for a couple more years. But it all depends on who he has with him on his team. That, that's a big part of it. I asked Chan in the same question. Here's what oh. I have to say. All right, Chan, we met back in 2018 when you were getting ready to make the step to, to the NFL. And you were surprised at the amount of work that went into that. Mm -hmm. Fast forward two years, are you surprised at the amount of work you have to put in now? Mm -hmm. Like you said, 2018, when I was getting ready for the you know, the NFL draft, between the Senior Bowl and the Combine, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. You know, it's, it wasn't what people see on TV. It's a lot more uh, mentally exhausting, emotionally exhausting, and it's the same now. You know, of course, people see the games on Sunday, but people don't see what it takes to prepare for the games. So, you know, it's an emotional roller coaster. Uh, it's very physical, but I, I think I've handled it well. Obviously, coming from Georgia State, a smaller school, what was 
tougher for you to adjust to? The physical mm -hmm. adjustment, because you're going up against bigger guys now, mm -hmm. stronger guys, faster guys, or that mental adjustment, because you have a thicker playbook and mm -hmm. a lot more things you're reading off of a lot quicker. Yeah, I think it was more mental than anything. Physically, I've always felt like I've been a superior athlete and I can you know, hang with the best of them. Uh, but mentally, understanding that it's going to be a lot of highs, it's going to be a lot of lows, you got to understand this is your job now. So like you yeah. said, the playbook, studying film, uh, and just showing that I belong was probably the hardest part. Take me to those lows. You said there's a lot of highs and lows. What have those mm -hmm. lows been? Because, I mean, two, year, two years, two teams, mm -hmm. I mean, imagine that's not, that's not easy. Yeah, so like you said, I pretty much went through every phase in two years. I went undrafted, uh, made the practice squad, moved up to the active roster, back down to the practice squad, come back for OTAs, get released in May. So it's like, dang. Then I re-signed with another team. Had there was an injury hold. in there, too. Yeah, an injury. I was back with hamstring. So having to go to another team, relearn the playbook, try to reestablish myself. Uh, it was definitely a roller coaster. So, you know, that was a low point. Who's somebody that you were able to lean on during that time? Um, of course, my family, just friends, people who knew me and stayed with me throughout the process. And then when I got to Green Bay, just looking to the veterans like Tremont Williams, number 38, a guy who had a similar situation, came in undrafted, you know, has had a very lucrative career since then, so. Was there a moment uh, for you this might sound weird. Is there a moment for you where maybe you felt like you belonged? Because I imagine, mm -hmm. you know, you're a two-star guy coming out of yeah. high school, only three offers, mm -hmm. go to Georgia State. Yeah. You can't realistically think the NFL is, is, is an option, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so was there a moment where you were like, I, I belong here. This is where I'm supposed What's to be. What's crazy is I knew it all, all along. And really? the hardest part was getting other people to believe in me. Um, I told my parents when I was eight, like, this is something I'm going to do. I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. So going to Georgia State, um, going into a new program, I accepted all challenges and I, I worked my tail off to get an opportunity to be in the NFL. And I told myself once I get a legitimate shot, I'm never going to look back. Was that dream hard to believe sometimes? Uh, I never lost confidence in myself, but it's always going to be highs, it's always going to be lows. And you know, necessarily going to Georgia State, a new program, we were winning a lot. You know, the odds say I wouldn't be here, but you know, I just stayed focused and, and just kept believing. Yeah, and, and so, you know, I want to go back to, to you being that that two-star guy out of Winder Barrow. <laughs> just, you know, if you could look back and maybe say something to that 18-year-old mm -hmm. Chandon, right? What, what would you say to him? I mean, because... I would tell him, um, you did a good job. You know, like I said, I came from a city where not a lot of people make it out. I went to Georgia State, a new program. I went undrafted, and then also found a way to become, you know, a key, key player on a very good defense this year. So it can be done. It's just a matter of staying patient and staying consistent. And, you know, this might have been your your second year in the league, mm -hmm. but you know, when you're with the Eagles, I mean, let's be real, that, the game checks are look, looking a little different yeah. in, in Green Bay now. For sure. So, what what was that adjustment like for you? Because that's also that's a big adjustment for a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you just get these huge checks that you're not used to used to seeing. Well, it's crazy. I, I prepared myself mentally for that. You know, I knew it would come eventually. So. When it finally happened, I wasn't shocked. I wasn't, you know, overwhelmed. Come on now, you saw that. <laughs> I was, it was everything I thought it would be. So I played it smart and I'm in a good city, Green Bay. There's nothing else to do but play football. So it wasn't like it was hard to save money. No, the money's there. And uh, I'm able to come home and do the things I want to do now. You're a free agent, you want to go back to Green Bay? Of course, you know, I just, I love everything about the city. I love the fans. Um, we were very successful this year and we almost made it to, you know, the big dance in the Super Bowl. So. I definitely feel like it's unfinished business there. And I feel like you took a, a step forward this year as, as mm -hmm. a player. Um, you know, you find, get that first pick. Yeah, it's uh, amazing. Pick off Dak, what, what's that like? <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I just remember when we went to Dallas when I was a rookie, I was watching the game. I wasn't playing. I was on the 53, but I was on, well, I was on the act of 46. So to fast forward a year later and actually be playing and, you know, like starting basically and to make a play in front of, you know, my family, my friends, it was, it was surreal. So. I don't know how many games you were playing in Philly, but mm -hmm. you played in all 16, or you played in 16 games yeah. um, in Green Bay. To see that increase mm -hmm. in, in playing time, did that kind of reassure you in a way like, I'm doing something right, this is, you know, I'm doing the for right sure. things here, this uh, is. Yeah, for sure, like I played probably five games in Philly last year. So after the season, I hit the reset button, whether it was with Philly or whatever team, I told myself I would be active the whole year. I would make the 53. I wrote the goals down and I prepared myself for the moment. So when it came, I was ready. And I feel like that's the biggest difference between last year and this year. I was able to see the ins and outs of the NFL. I was able to assess my own weaknesses, my own strengths, and implement it into the game. And I feel like that's why I was successful this year. 
All right, I want to kind of pick your brain a little bit now, mm -hmm. to peel back the curtain a little bit, because obviously if you're in Green Bay, Aaron Rodgers is the, is the big name. <laughs> what's, what's going up against a, a legend like Aaron mm -hmm. Rodgers? Like every, every day in practice, yeah. you're going up against what some would say is probably the best quarterback to, to play sure. the game. Uh, at first, you know, it was a little, I was probably starstruck, I guess you could say, because that was my first time seeing him in person and seeing how he carries himself as a leader on and off the field. It took a little time to get used to, but then I, I found confidence in if I can perform well in practice against him, any other quarterback in the league shouldn't be a problem for me. So that was my mindset. I want to I take, uh, take a minute and kind of go on a little tangent here because you just mentioned being starstruck. Who's that receiver or that guy, you know, you're lined up, you're reading your keys, you're doing everything you're supposed to do, and then you look and you're like, oh, shit, that's <laughs> blank. Who, who's, that, who's that person? It's you, a few guys, honestly. Who, no, no, who was that first person that when you left? Okay. Who was that guy? Well, first person, probably Odell Beckham last year. I was my, probably first, my first game starting as an Eagle. I was playing cornerback, and you look across, you see Odell. And it's like everybody Did you know. Was there like a, a lock eyes moment? Oh, yeah, just... of course. And he's actually a pretty cool dude. We chopped it up during the game. But that was my first like, oh, man, this is real. Like, I'm lined up, press. My first rep is against him. So that was probably my first moment. But, you know, it's, it's a list goes on. Who are those other guys? Other guys even this year. Kittle, George Kittle. That's a big guy. Uh, Were you able to K tackle? Did you tackle Kittle this year? Because we uh, look. I didn't tackle him, but I had to guard him. I was guarding him one-on-one, -on -one, man coverage. You took on one of those blocks? Uh, yeah. I had to, you know. Get, <laughs> Hold on now. Were, were, you, were you one of those pancakes? Because he, he he has a lot of. Not pan me. Not okay, me. he didn't get. He didn't put you on the back. Pan, no. Pancake me. Uh, uh, Kelsey from Chiefs. Yeah. That's another big guy. You know, Michael Thomas. I've had to guard all these guys so far. And, and now you are. I mean, you're one of those guys now. I mean, yeah. I, I think I've seen you on on Twitter, social media. You know, you have people tweeting you like, "Hey, you signed my son's jersey, or you mm -hmm. signed this, and this meant so much to them." What is that like for you? Because it's almost like, do you even realize the impact that you can have on, mm -hmm. on people like that? Because I, I imagine to you, you're still just, you're just chanting. Yeah. The person you've always been. It's, you're just like, weird. What, To me, it's, I'm still just chanting. But uh, seeing the impact I can have on other fans and, you know, the youth, it's amazing. And I, I don't feel like I realized the magnitude of it during the season, but now I'm able to sit back and reflect on it. It's amazing. So. Yeah, and, and you know, when you think of the average NFL career only being a couple of years, how mm -hmm. do you keep it in perspective but also cherish those moments? Um, uh, of course, I cherish it and I don't take it for granted, but I also understand what comes with it. You know, I try to stay on top of my body, my health, you know, the physical, the emotional standpoint, because it's a long season. Like, uh, so if I don't do those things, then it becomes a drag and it becomes hard. So I think, you know, it's working out so far. What was that, what was that adjustment? Because you're a guy, I mean, you, you take care of your body, you take care of everything. Mm -hmm. but I mean, what was, was there something you had to cut out diet-wise or maybe mm -hmm. not being on the phone late or, you know, playing video games? What, what was that thing you had to cut off to maybe take that next step in, in your game? I think the biggest part was just finding a routine and sticking with it. That was the main thing when I was talking to the, the veterans on our team. Like, what do you do to prepare yourself for such a long season? Because like you said, I played four preseason game, games. I played 16 regular season games and then two playoff games. So it was a long year. So if you don't, you know, find a routine and something you can stick to it, it gets tedious and you get fatigued. So I think that was the biggest thing. Is that a routine like taking care of your body mm -hmm. or? Doing the same thing, whether it's hitting the sauna in the steam room every day at the same time, whether it's eating the same meals Monday through Friday, uh, going to sleep at the same time. You have to find something that allows your and body to And that's different from college. It's different in college. You know, I was on a whole different schedule. This is my job now. College, I was trying to balance school first, you know, making sure I got A's and then play football. This is my job. This is my profession. So I put everything I, you know, I have into it. How do you take that next step? Is you know you were on a one-year deal last mm -hmm. year, um, free agent now, mm -hmm. made some plays this year. But what is going to take your game to to the next level? Mm -hmm. uh, reflecting on the season, seeing what I did well, seeing what I need to work on, and now that I have people's attention, next year I feel like I can take steps to really you know take over. Now. When did you realize you had people's attention? Was it, was it when maybe the camera started coming to you in the locker room? Because that wasn't probably wasn't. always the case, and then yeah. all of a sudden they start creeping after. Was it after mm -hmm. the Dallas game? Uh, I feel like after the Dallas game, people was like, who is, who is Channing Southern? And I was like, I've been here all along. I've been trying to get your attention. You know, I feel like I'm the future. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, now that you have that attention, mm -hmm. not only how do you, you, you keep it, but mm -hmm. how do you take that next step? I mean, I know we kind of, we already went there, but. Uh, putting pressure on myself. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, finding ways to never get complacent. Finding ways to make myself better. And it's, it's funny, you know, I find ways to have that mamba mentality. You know what yeah. I'm saying? finding ways to perfect your craft and give your all. And then I feel like when you do that, you'll get the results you want. It's funny you bring up the, the Mamba mentality because I, 
spoke earlier in the week, mm -hmm. um, you know, once the news of, of, of Kobe's passing um, kind of became came out, I said that his legacy is that Mamba mentality, and it's something that doesn't just apply to basketball. Mm -hmm. it, you can apply, I can apply that to my job Anything. right now. Yeah. It's just setting your mind on something and refusing to be denied. So what, is that, mm -hmm. what does that Mamba mentality mean, mean to you? Uh, exactly that, it's setting our goals and not stopping until you reach it. You know, a lot of people are blessed with talents, but they don't match it with the work ethic. And I feel like that's why so many people respected Kobe. Yeah, he's been a phenom since he was a kid, but his work ethic separated him. And then that's how he become one of the greats. And I just try to apply that to myself, you know, coming from a small school, a small city, I've always had talent, but I just try to match it with that work ethic. Is it easier for you to spot that because you're somebody who's always had to put in that hard mm -hmm. work to, to get the results? When you, Is it easy for you to see guys that just have the talent that maybe don't put the work in? Yeah, it's easy to spot, and that's what makes it so frustrating. You know, some guys are naturally able to do things that other guys can't do, and they just settle with that. But it's like, dang, if you match it with the same work ethic that these, some of these other guys have, you'd be the greatest. And that's how you know, it's frustrating at times. All right. I'm gonna take you to a painful moment here. That last mm -hmm. last game of the season. Yeah. The season's over. What's that locker room like? Because um, you guys are probably thinking Super Bowl. Yeah, that's that's that was the goal from day one. You know, we was able to win the NFC North division. That's not enough. We wanted to win the NFC. The whole thing fell short, which means we fell short of going to the Super Bowl. So you feel for the older guys, the guys who don't have rings yet, the Jimmy Grahams, the guys who've been so close but just, you know, wasn't able to pull it off. So I feel for them, but it's also motivation for me going into year three because it's unfinished business. We got so close, so it can be done. We just got to get over that hump. You, you really do feel like, I can tell, you feel like Green Bay. You're, you're saying a lot of we's, a lot of mm -hmm. us. Yeah. That's where you want to be. Mm -hmm, for sure. Just because they gave me an opportunity to show my talents, and I feel like I was able to do that. So I feel like the whole world know what I'm able to do now. What did they see in you? Because, mm -hmm. you know, when, when you get waved by the Eagles, you're coming yeah. off that hamstring, like you're, like you're saying, you have to be like, all right, where am I gonna, where am I gonna land mm -hmm. here? What do you think they saw in you at, at that point that let them know that you could be the kind of guy that they could put out there for 16 games and mm -hmm. get plays? I think I had to assess myself. What, what did I do to get myself to this point? And that was my versatility. You go back to high school, you go back to college, and that's what it was. So my first day with our defensive coach, he had us fill out a sheet. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And wh how can you help this team? And I told him straight up, I could play any position in the secondary. So after I said that, he gave me the playbook and he helped me to that. And I, I studied my tail off to learn every position, whether it's free safety, strong safety, corner, nickel, dime, and they threw me in and I was able to produce. So my role just continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I feel like that's how it happened. All right, I'm gonna, I got a couple more for you then I'll, I'll let you go. Um, a lot of people talking about Aaron, Wad Aaron Rodgers kind of being on the downslope. How many more years do you think he's got? As many as he wants to play. He takes care of his body. He's, he still has it. His arms. You think he's washed? People no. are saying he's washed. No. No? No. Come on now. You I'm with him every day. He's if not that, washed. If that's, that's washed, I want to see what <laughs> exactly. So he has the best arm in the NFL. You know, the, the throws he can make off his back foot, scrambling to the right, throwing back. It's, it's uns it's unbelievable, and I see it in practice every day. The no-look passes, Mahomes not the only one that does it. He may not do it as much, but he can do that, and it's crazy to see it every day. Super Bowl, you watching it? I'm watching. I'm okay. watching. It's going to hurt, but I watch it. Who you got? Is there, do, 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 can, you, can you even pick, or you just... I don't even want to pick, just because that was supposed to be us. We fell short. We, yeah. It's tough. It's, it's tough, yeah. It's a long season. When you fall short, People don't realize how many. You see your teammates more than you see your own family. So it really does become a brotherhood. So when you fall short, it hurts. But, you know, good luck to both teams. All right, let's keep this Super Bowl conversation going, Rick. We got a couple prop bets here. Let's start with the national anthem, everyone's favorite yeah. prop bet. Uh, this year, Demi Lovato okay. singing the anthem. Over under set at two minutes. Mm -hmm. The uh, over, getting a lot of juice, minus 240. What are you thinking about that? So I always like to research these things. Even I've done some homework too. Even the national on. anthem. Okay, so the first thing I did was I looked at, how can I research this? So I looked at the last maybe 10 national anthems in, in average time. Mm -hmm. But then I was thinking, wait a second, every singer is different. You know, sometimes they're outdoors, sometimes they're indoors. Every situation's different, so that's not going to work. So then I did some Demi Lovato research. You'll be proud of me. Probably the first time I'll ever do it. 
or the only time we'll ever do it. We are thinking the same way, just so you know. So I, I found that she's done four like major, mm -hmm. is that right, sporting events. She did the McGregor Mayweather yep, national. That's her most recent one, 2017. So I think so. I think I saw the average was something like 157 or 158. She went 212 in Mayweather McGregor. And she's been under three of the four times. Okay, so I'm thinking, wait a second, under three of the four, the trend is to be under. But then you think it's the Super Bowl. There's going to be some nerves, maybe an extra pause or two. I think she's, this is like, like her second performance. I think the Grammys was her first in a couple of years. So probably still some nerves. I think it'll be drawn out a bit. So I'm going to go over two. I don't think it's going to be that much over, but I think it's going over. I think it's going to go over as well. Um, if you watch the McGregor Mayweather performance, uh, she, likes to, she likes to go on those long runs. Mm -hmm. She likes to take those pauses. Yeah. And she takes her time. And I think the Super Bowl is one of those events you know the whole world yeah. is watching you. And you take your time. Now, one thing we should note about the uh, National Anthem prop bet, because last year with Gladys Knight, we had a little bit of confusion with, uh, with her. The bet ends on the first brave. The first brave, because Gladys threw out three braves last time. I see. Last, so it's not necessarily time. when she's done. It's not when singing. she's done. It okay. is at, at the end of the first brave. That is when the bet ends. And last year, there was a lot of confusion because the first brave was under, but the third brave yeah. pushed her over. Isn't that so the worst, though? Because it, you A lot to, of overbetters think, are like happy about it, but then they find out that they think didn't Think about win. how you have to get clarification on the national you got to read the fine print. you got to know what you're maybe, doing. Maybe you, sh maybe you have a gambling problem <laughs> when you're fighting over how many braves there are in the national anthem. I, I that's what's great. I mean, everyone's sitting there with their iPhones like, ah, yeah. that's, that's awesome. But, right. but we agree. We're going over. We're going over. We're going yeah, over. All right, let's so. move on to the second one. Let's talk about the halftime performance. We got uh, J-Lo and Shakira yep. and DJ Khaled performing. Yes. Will Will Smith make an appearance, yes or no? No, the heavy favorite, minus 480. I'm going to say yes because I like – yes is plus 290. I like, yeah. I like the yes here because we don't know what DJ Khaled's going to do. Right. And there's don't a lot of options. Much. Rick Ross, I think, is going to make an, uh, an appearance. He's Miami. Um, I think you got to bring Will Smith out. He's got to do Miami, right? Well, I was going to say, the song, so everything points against it. And I'm wondering why the no has that value. Somebody must know something. But, I mean, surprises. You can bring somebody out at the Absolutely. last minute and do something. And the song Miami, you've got to bring him out. Now, I don't know if there's the, what the history is between Will Smith and DJ Khaled. Is there a beef mm -hmm. there? That, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, no, no, no. Will Smith doesn't have beef with anybody, no. Yeah, exactly. So if there's no beef there... And it's Will Smith, and he's going to come out and sing Miami. I mean, he never sings anymore. He'll, he'll do, like, stuff on Fallon. But, I mean, you've got to bring him out for a 30-second That's verse, what I'm right? saying. Just bring him out, give, get the people happy, give us Miami, and then move on to the next. I think it's going to be, but like. But no being at minus 400, 480. Yeah. yeah, that's. it seems like somebody knows somebody something. Knows something. <laughs> but there's more value in yes. It makes more sense to do yes. So I think yes. So you're going yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, and let's go with the last one. This is my personal favorite one. The color of the liquid right. that's going to be poured on the winning head coach. What color are you going with? I'm going with orange. Now, orange is plus 550. Okay, and that's a good value. The, vi the favorite, I think, is red. still red. Yeah. Now, I, there has never been a red liquid, Gatorade, Powerade, whatever. Is that just because it's the team color? Is that why that's the favorite? Now, that's never, not how this works. Uh, the only thing I can think red of. Red is nasty. Who drinks red Gatorade? And then I thought, I said, wait a second. Maybe they used, let me look back last week when the Chiefs won, when the, or two weeks ago when oh, they, when they beat the Titans. Was the red, and they didn't dump anything on Andy Reid. So it could be if Kansas City wins, maybe they don't dump anything at all, although I can't believe they wouldn't dump something on him after all the years of failure for Andy Reid. But there's never been red anything poured on any winner in the history of the Super Bowl. I don't know why it's the favorite. Uh, Is this have, something where you think somebody knows something? Somebody must know something. But, and maybe they do. I mean, maybe they talk to an equipment guy. I don't know. But I don't have any scientific reason for orange. It just seemed like a good color to pick. But I'm against red. I'm leaning towards no liquid or orange. But I have to pick a color. I'm going orange. I'm going clear. I'm going to go with okay. water. These are two fast teams. they got to yeah. stay hydrated, and they don't want all that sugar that's in the Gatorade yeah. and the Powerade, whatever that liquid yeah. is. They just want that H2O, that yeah. high-quality H2O. So I'm going with water. It's going to be a warm night. So I, I, you got to stay hydrated. you got to stay hydrated. There's going to be a lot of it on the sideline. And that's why I think when I, when I said none, well, it's not cold. They don't have to worry about people getting mad because it'll be warm. So I think they're, I'm still going to go with orange. Uh, red, I just don't know. Where, I guess because of the team. Now, color, here's the so problem I have with, with this, because yeah. purple plus 850. Purple's actually been dumped in the past, I want to say, yeah. 
15 Couple years of times. or so. Yeah. Um, purple's my favorite. Yeah. Flavor Gatorade. Riptide Again, Rush. I mean, it's maybe just they getting, haven't. It's getting severely undervalued here. So I might throw a little, little bit on There's purple probably here. They probably did some research and maybe looked on the sideline for 49ers Chiefs games. What kind of liquid do they have? And maybe red has been a popular color. I don't know. I, I haven't been to many of their games. Purple. I'd like purple even over red. Yeah. All right, let's wrap this up and okay. talk a little bit about the game. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's right. There's a game. There's, there is a game. <laughs> yeah. uh, right now, Niners getting one and a half mm -hmm. points. How are you feeling about that? Because I've been going back and forth. Man, I have too. This is one of the tougher ones to call. Um, I'm going, I, I picked the Chiefs initially. I'm sticking with the Chiefs. You're going to lay one and a half points. Yeah, I, I'm fine with that. They okay. can, you know, I mean, the odds of them winning by one, you know, I mean, they're probably going to, if they win, they win by a field goal by seven, by 10. I, I'm sticking with the Chiefs right now. Nothing is, has made me change my mind. I've seen nothing to make me change my mind the last couple of days. So I think the Chiefs will win. It just seems, I said this a couple weeks ago before the college football game, it, it just kind of seemed like uh, LSU's time. It seemed like their year. It just seems like Andy Reid's year now. Um, with everything, he finally got over that hump, finally got back to a Super Bowl for the second time after all those disappointments with Kansas City. You know, San Francisco, they're new. They haven't really paid their dues. I just, it feels like, like it was LSU's year. It feels like it's Kansas City's year. I'm going with the Chiefs. See, uh the way I'm feeling right now, uh, I'm, I'm going with you because initially I'm thinking, well, what do you need to do to win football mm -hmm. games? Play defense and run the yeah. ball. That's what the Niners do. That's what they do. That's what they do really well. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're doing. They're going to line up. They're going to run the ball down your throat. Mm -hmm. And we know what their defense is. Their defense is rock solid. Uh, but for some reason, I'm rolling with the Chiefs because the teams that the Niners have struggled with this year have had mobile quarterbacks. Yeah. Pat Mahomes can move around a little oh, bit, yeah. change the pocket. He knows how to pick you apart. So I think that he is going to be that guy that can cause some problems. Now, if that Niners defensive line is able to get to him, that's going to change things. But right now, I'm going to lay the one and a half points. I'm going to go with the And here's the, the other well. issue, too. What happens if the Chiefs get up 7 nothing, 14 nothing? And they may not. But if they do, you got to get away from running the ball. Like that. Well, for, well, hold on. I know people are like Mark Zeno are out there saying you, you can't get away from it. But when it's a 14 point game, keep running the ball. They're going to stop running. Right. The ball. And do you have faith in Jimmy G and that crew to no. get you back into a game and no. a shootout? So that's I don't. so that's why I think the first quarter is going to be important too. I mean, if it's zero zero three nothing after the first quarter, then maybe you start to feel a little better. But if the the Chiefs get a few couple touchdowns early, then then they're playing catch up. And the 49ers, that's not that's not their strength. They're not a catch up team. All right. So we're both rolling with the Chiefs. That is the Look Alive podcast for this week. Thanks for tuning in. As always, please subscribe, like, download, share, do all that stuff. Uh, shoot us a comment. Uh, let us know what you think. And you can also at me on Twitter at Alex underscore, underscore Glaze. And let me know who you want to hear for, from in the coming weeks. We are always looking for uh, Atlanta sports figures to, to talk to and talk about on this podcast. That's what we're here for. That's what we do. All right. Thanks for checking us out. The Look Alive podcast is sponsored by Sonic.